All right, hold up, everyone. Okay, can the first slide come up? Um, the title of my presentation is, you know, we've spent a lot about on um, what Kemet is, but the title of my presentation is Why Kemet? Uh, insights into reconceptually na reconceptualizing national identity. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to dedicate this presentation to uh, Shake on to Joe. And next slide. And in the 1974 UNESCO symposium, uh, Shake on to Joe actually gives credit to deciphering what the word Kemet means. He actually gives credit to another African. Um, this other African, he says, is Susu in Sugan, uh, it was to compile this part of the present chapter. Uh, so um, I give credit to this brother too uh, for this particular piece. Next slide. Um, at the UNESCO conference, just a, a brief review. Um, at the UNESCO conference, when you read the proceedings of the unabridged volume of the General History of Africa, Volume 2, there is a debate many debates, but there is a debate around the word Kemet. But the main protagonist was a brother from the Sudan, uh, Abdel Ghadir Abdallah. And Abdallah, I kind of feel like we're recreating the 1974 UNESCO conference. Um, because Abdallah um, said at that conference that uh, the word Kim didn't mean black. And that was what started the whole tete-a-tete -tete at the UNESCO symposium on the issue of Kemet. And so immediately after he said that, a French Egyptologist, Sir Saint Laurent, intervened. And Sir Saint Laurent intervened and said, no, 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 no. Kim does mean black. And so Sir Saint Laurent and Jean Leclerc their debates with Sheikh Anta Joke were over issues of race and culture. But not an issue of whether or not the word Kim meant black. Next slide. By way of conclusion, so if I don't complete my time, <laughs> I'm going to give you my conclusions up front. Okay? By way of conclusion, the word Kemet refers to a novel ethno-geopolitical national marker of identity that was primarily forged in the cauldron of the internal contradictions and in politics of what is referred as the first intermediate period. Novel in two fundamental ways. One, the innovation of a unitary concept of a nation and two, the political need to more rigidly distinguish themselves as a nation of people which is clearly shown in a new hyper discourse around borders, Tosh, internally and externally, initially and principally directed against the people from Western Asia in the first intermediate period. Next slide. So, how do we know? So, you know, Asar, you know, gave some examples of my work and I'm going to give some examples of your work. Um, how do we know that Asar Imhotep means Osiris who comes in peace? How is it that we know that? We know that through a process of historical evolution within the Kemetic language, where Asar is Usire in Coptic. E, which is to come, continues all the way to Coptic. Hotep is a word that continues from the beginning all the way to Coptic. Asar's method, unfortunately, is not a historical comparative method. It's an ahistorical comparative method. It's ahistorical in the sense that what Asar does is that he wants to bypass 
the historical evolution of the Egyptian language that ends in Coptic. And so because he does not feel that Coptic is a part of the Egyptian language, he feels that it's a separate language. So what Asar does in his comparative method is that he goes into other areas and he doesn't go through Coptic. He goes around it. And that's where Obinga's method is the correct method. And the correct method is actually a free translation. Tepeseb means atop the county. How do we know that? Through Coptic. So as a result, every time you bypass Coptic, you are implicitly saying that Metunetcher has not been deciphered. In your method. Because when you make translations of any text, ask yourself, how is it that we get Khenu means residence? How do we get to that? Are we guessing? Or is there a long historical evolution that ends in Coptic? And so this is what's at stake. So I'm giving this example up here from Jaroslav Czerny's Coptic Etymological Dictionary. This is the English version. What um, I'll come to Ogden Golay's article in a minute. Um, but Ogden, uh, in his piece, he gives the uh, French version of Werner Vissichel, uh, Dictionnaire Etymologique de la langue Copte. Um, but in both languages, when you see and I don't have my clicker up here. But when you see Kimon become black, Kame black, and you see it in demonic there, and then it has Keme black land, Egypt. That means, and then of course, in the Veritable that you like to cite, the earliest reference to Kim that the Veritable gives is from the Second Dynasty, where the determinative on Kim is the horse, falcon, on a standard. And how does he translate it? The black horse. In the vertical. So from the earliest attestation, from the second dynasty onward, we actually see Kim meaning black. So you ask, the question is, how do we get to this? That is, that Kim as a root has a long evolution inside the comedic uh, inside the comedic language next um, uh, brother um, Reggie gave a text um, from the pyramid text and this text is actually from the text of uh, uh, the pyramid of Pepe the first and uh, the line is here his transcription is in the second line uh, there aha ek kinti kimet you happy uh, and then east. Next, next line. This is James Allen's translation of this. Uh, you shall stand at the fore of the dual flagpole shrines as men. You shall stand at the fore of those of black land uh, as the apis. That is that Allen is translating because Allen is translating that um, as a Nesby adjective and it's, it's proper. That's what you see there. But it's an interesting parallel here. Uh, in terms of what you see, because as uh, Reggie said, there's a couple of uh, points that Reggie's making very strong here, but as uh, Reggie said, um, the Apis bull is a, not just a sacred bull, but it's a black bull. <laughs> yep. uh, so when you see here, you know, those of the black land as Apis, it's actually an emphasis on the fact that it's black. But the interesting thing is that with Pepe the, the first, we're in the sixth dynasty, and this is kind of what I want to talk about today, is that we're in the sixth dynasty, the reference by Ogden Golay, which I'm coming to in a minute, in terms of the historical reference, this implies, commit to you implies a commit. But the problem is, is that we only see it in the pyramid text. But it's, it implies an old kingdom origin point that's local, social, descriptive. Next slide. 
But the issue is, is that when we look at a text by Nigel Strugwick, text from the Pyramid Age, Nigel Strugwick, this is the most comprehensive compilation of texts in the English language that you can read um, of the Old Kingdom. And I've looked at every one of these texts. And when you look at all of these texts, what you see is that Kemet is not a word that is used in the Old Kingdom to describe their land. Um, and it's quite interesting. So that there is something that is going on. We can't fully see what is going on in the Second Dynasty all the way up until the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. But there is something there. Next slide. Um, some of this, some of our conversation is actually, uh, some of what I've seen um, is actually an engagement with the work of Ogden Golay here and an article that he wrote, Kemet and Other Egyptian Terms for Their Land. And Ogden was a professor um, at New York University. I actually worked with him uh, when I was scholar in residence here at uh, NYU. Um, and I actually have all of his files that were thrown away in the trash by NYU. Um, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> but, um, but Ogden, in this, next slide. Uh, well, before I come back to Ogden, I'm going to give this presentation as a shout out to my master teacher, uh, Theophilo Bing. Um, and, you know, Dr. Carruthers has always taught me, many have taught me, is to let the ancestors speak for themselves and let the elders speak for themselves. And so, I want to, I'm not going to, in terms of what Kemet is, I'm going to read Obinga <laughs> and my translation of Obinga in French and uh, from French. And this is a work, a relatively recent work that uh, Obinga uh, has uh, published. And this is part of a debate. It's a, a book called Le Sang de la Lue contre l'Africanisme Eurocentriste meaning of the struggle against Eurocentric Africanism. And this is an uh, excerpt from this book in a debate that he held uh, or in print with Marc Etienne, uh, who is the curator of the Egyptian collection at the Louvre Museum. So I'm just going to read you what he wrote um, in response to Marc Etienne in this debate, which actually uh, resolves some of the issues that we're talking about. Next slide. Uh, and he's quoting uh, Mark Etienne here. As a result, um, the ancient Egyptians were black African like all other natives uh, of the African continent. Of course, there are blacks not only in Africa, but in South India and Melanesia, for example. Mark Etienne has not yet mastered the Egyptian language written in hieroglyphs. And now he's quote, quoting Etienne. The name of Egypt, Kemet, is often translated erroneously by Sheikh Antajok as the country of the blacks, with grammatical errors added by uh, T. Obinga Passam. Next slide. This translation is based on the distinction, this is still Etienne, this translation is based on the distinction made by the Egyptian text between one part called the black land, Ta Kim, and it's using Ta as a definite article, Ta Kim. Um, that is to say the cultivated valley in reference to the color of the Nile soil. And the other part, the red land, that is to say the desert. The word Kim means to be complete in the sense of completed, achieved, which refers to the well-attested concept of the unity of Egypt materialized by the union of the two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt, but also the unity of the country as a divine eye with perfect integrity. He's quoting Mark Etienne here. Next. And now here is Obinga's voice. Mark Etienne wanders. And it is a serious error for a quote-unquote curator of Egyptian antiquities at the Louvre Museum in Paris. What he writes does not make any sense. Shake on to joke translated Kemet by the land of the blacks in which work, which page? I have advanced this translation with grammatical errors in which work, which page? Why lie constantly, you Eurocentric Africans? Next slide. Now 
he's giving his demonstration. If Ty Kim means black land, and if you consider Kim to be complete, completed, achieved in the translation of this expression, Ta Kim, what is then the final translation? Something like this, complete black land, black land completed. That is, here the word Kim has a double meaning, black and to be complete at the same time. Mark Etienne is totally wrong. He ignores the existence of synonyms and homonyms in Egyptian. He confuses everything with incredible frivolity. Next slide. Here are the facts ignored by Marc Etienne. Kim noir adjective. The hieroglyph of the owl is employed as a phonetic complement. Kim to complete, to, to be complete. You see the uh, determinative of the papyrus road of tide and seal. Um, at the end there, conveying abstract notion. Thus, there exist two words, Kim, which are homonyms, but not synonyms. Adjective black and the verb to be complete. Next slide. They are different at both the lexical and grammatical level for all Egyptologists of the world, with the exception of the erudite curator of the Louvre, Mark Etienne. Next slide. Um, what is the authentic Egyptian text that has or presents Ta Kim black land to designate Egypt? There is no text. That's what Obinga is saying. Like, why are you even, you know, coming at me with this? Um, this designation is a pure invention of our Egyptological scholar who should avoid the scientific lie. Mark Etienne is a dishonest man in regards to scientific research. The well-attested concept of the unity of Egypt, materialized by the union of the two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt, is not Kim to be complete, but it is Sema to unite and also Chess to unite. Everyone knows that. Next slide. The Sema Tawi right unification of the two lands is known by the beginner studying Egyptology. Mark Etienne can now learn it. Next slide. In addition, the Egyptian lexicon gives the following. Kemet, le pays noir, the black country in English. Kemet, les gens de pays noir, les hommes et les femmes de pays noir, les habitants de pays noir. That is the Egyptians of pharaonic times. That is, the men and women of the black country, the people of the black country, the inhabitants of uh, the black country. The inhabitants of black Africa are black African. The inhabitants of the black country are blacks. It is the same reasoning. The Melanesians are precisely black islanders. Melas, black, and Nessos, Dorian, Nassos, island in Greek. Next slide. In his work, Ogden Golay um, makes a distinction between two concepts. One concept is uh, Jeru, uh, limits, and the other concept is uh, Tashu, borders. And Jeru is a concept of limits um, that is primarily in the spiritual sphere. It deals with time and space on a broad level. But when the Kimites employ Tash, they employ that in a more geopolitical sense. And what is missed by Ogden Golay in his article is that he, is, he doesn't present the historical context of the origin of those concepts. Next slide. And that is that what Ogden doesn't do in that article is that he doesn't give a precise origin to the discourse around Tosh borders. This is a very important point in this discussion. There is a hypersensitivity of the concept of Tashu borders in Egyptian texts that begins in the first intermediate period, which is not captured or even historically contextualized properly in uh, Gole's uh, uh, narrative frame. And I just give one example here, and I give a text where you can read many examples from for yourself uh, in Jose Galan, Victory and Border. Um, Approach me, Keti. I shall make a storm over the province. My rule is Neket after I have made my tosh as far as Wadi Hesi. Stella of the overseer of Jari, recording Intep's words addressed to Keti. So the point is here is that there is, when the ancient Egyptians are in this context spending over, well over a hundred years of fighting each other, 
there is now a fractured national consciousness. And that fractured national consciousness, consciousness internally is playing out with this hypersensitivity of borders. Against themselves, initially, this goes into my discourse on Hasi also that you talk about. Everything is linked. Next, next slide. So, as Asar has rightly said um, in a presentation, is that in the Old Kingdom, primarily, when we look at administrative text, what we can see is we see Tawi, uh, the two lands, we see Edemwi, two river, river banks, the two riparian lands, um, with the irrigated uh, canals. And then we see a new the resonance. Next slide. But somewhere, uh, and this is what this is from Ogden. Ogden says somewhere around the period when Egypt was once more reunified under the rule of Dynasty Eleven monarch Nehet uh, Pet Ra Menchuhotep II, the terms Kemet, the Black Land, and Ta Meri, uh, the Beloved Land, first made their appearance. And so what Ogden does in his article is, next slide, um, what Ogden does in his article is that he distinguishes between what he calls non-literary text um, and literary text, and to try to make this point. And every time that Ogden, this is an inference being made by uh, Egyptologists, that is that when they see Kemet translated in contrast to Deshret, when they see that, they are translating black land. Um, and it has a connotation for them of, quote unquote, soil, the soil. Uh, when they're not seeing that, then they're translating it as Egypt. That is, as something much broader than this. And so Asar makes a point um, in a presentation that I, I saw um, that when you see the determinatives of an irrigated canal on the back of Kemet, as opposed to the town or settlement, what Asar said in one of his presentations was that those two determinatives are interchangeable. No, they're not. Those two determinatives are in different semantic universes. So if you see an uh, irrigated canal on the back of Kemet, then yes, it is appropriate, it's quite appropriate to translate that as the black land. The black irrigated land, actually. But if you don't see that, you can't make that translation. When you see the town determinative on Kemet, you cannot make that translation. And it is not inferred or implied. Next slide. So I have some work to do myself because I did a little bit of work at uh, Johns Hopkins. And I said, because all of these texts that Ogden gave were very localized in a particular region called the Wadi Hamamat. And everyone knows is that these inscriptions are interesting because many of them lack definitive clarity in terms of the presentation and depicting the depictions of glyphs. And I said, I'm just going to take one text from Ogden and I'm going to just look at how the word Kemet is actually represented in one of his major citations. Because I don't, I, I don't accept what they say. I always want to have reference, as this is my, this is my teaching from Obing. Give me the original text. I don't want to see you. I don't want to see your mistakes. Egyptologists make mistakes all the time. And here, I don't even have the original text, but I'm actually closer because this is a hieroglyphic facsimile. So I actually tried to get the original text, but I couldn't. We actually need to see all of these texts actually before we even make a final determination on this. But what I want to show you is here. This right here. This right here. This is, quote unquote, their word for Kemet. And one of the texts that Ogden the Lay cites. You tell me, if you, Mpundishi, anyone in here who is taking the language, you tell me if that glyph looks like the Kim glyph. You tell me yes or no. The inference that's being made is that because of the phonetic complement is the Al, that that must be Kim. I don't see Kim in there. In fact, the angle is not there on the Kim glyph. And then it dips. It has a little dip at the end. I'm not even sure what this glyph is. 
This is a major text that he cited. So when, as we're making these points, as we're making these arguments, we need to actually look at the original text. That's a historical method. Next slide. And I'm going to go quick. Next slide. I'm going to skip this. Um, and so I'm going to end this presentation on uh, instructions from Mary Kyrie. Uh, Brother Reggie has uh, mentioned this also. But I wanted to talk about this text a lot. Um, Strengthen your borders, your frontier patrols. A wretch is he who desires the land of a neighbor. Troops will fight troops as the ancestors were told. Him it fought in the graveyard, destroying tombs and vengeful, vengeful uh, destruction. What is going on here, folks? is that, and, and I disagree with Ogden, because it is not Minshew Hotep II that is creating the concept of Kemet for the nation. That is, that in the process of the ancient Egyptians fighting themselves during the first intermediate period, this term has evolved, kind of like Fassi. This term has evolved from a descriptive kind of social concept and it has taken on a different geopolitical connotation in the environment of the first intermediate period that culminates with Minshew Hotep II, but does not begin with Minshew Hotep II. And what they're saying is that on an ethnic, on a geopolitical level, that we're the black country. And they're saying that to reaffirm who they were as a people, and also in their principal opposition of Western Asia in this text. Next slide. Lo, Dr. Carruthers quotes this all the time, Lo, the miserable Asiatic, he is wretched because of the place he's in, short of water, bare of wood, his paths are many and painful, because of mountains, he does not dwell in one place, food propels his legs, he fights since the time of Horus. I made Lord Egypt attack them, I captured their inhabitants, I seized their cattle until the Asi Asiatics abhorred Kim. This is where Alden is translating Kemet as Egypt. That is, that it goes beyond talking about the quote-unquote soil. And that's what the town determinative. And as Gardner translates this determinative in his hieroglyphic sign book, is that that glyph is, implies an inhabited region. That is, you're talking about the country and its people. And so what they are talking about when they say Kemet, as the black country, they are talking about both the country and the people. Thank you very much. Next panel, folks. We got to be on time. <laughs>